Nickelodeon in the early 1990s had a solid animation lineup. From Doug to Ren and Stimpy to Rugrats to Rocco's Modern Life. However, many of their live action shows at the beginning of the decade by 1994 were coming to a close and new ones were looking to be placed. In 1993, Welcome Freshman 15 ran their 65 episode course a four seasons run as well salute your shorts was canceled in 1993 following that in the following year clarissa was also ending after its five season run meanwhile pete and pete roundhouse were midway through their series already and on their way for production of their last season So what does this mean is that Nickelodeon was looking for new live action content to fill those spots. And one of those spots they wanted to fill was a sketch comedy show. Not like you can't do that on television and not like Roundhouse, but a different type of sketch comedy that has skits and musical guests. A Nickelodeon show called All That. A series that we'll be diving in season by season and reacting to moments we like and moments that are questionable for kids television. So let's deep dive and thrive. Before we get into this video, I just want to let you know that there is another video on Patreon after this. You can subscribe to my Patreon. Its link is put in the description. Feel free to go there and we will be talking every week with a new topic on Patreon for bonus content. Just thought I would let you know right now. So let's deep dive into Thrive into the video. All That was a Nickelodeon sketch comedy live action show that premiered on April 16th, 1994. It has a long lasting legacy that lasted up until December 2020 with 11 seasons and 211 episodes. The show has been rebooted on several occasions. It had a run in the 90s, which was its most prime golden era. And then it had a run in the early to mid 2000s that was more of its like new generation era. And then again, recently in 2019 with a reboot era post Dan Schneider, of course, which we will of course get into him and the Dan Schneider of it all. (laughs) This is also the first series of Nickelodeon that marks the beginning of Dan Schneider's legacy into Nickelodeon, as well as the launching pad for many other stars such as Kenan Thompson, Kel Mitchell, Amanda Bynes, Nick Cannon, and so many more. But let's go back to how all that was first created. Back in the late 80s, Dan Schneider, along with co-creator Brian Robbins, acted in a sitcom called Head of the Class. During the time... Dan and Brian were asked to host the second annual Kids' Choice Awards with Debbie Gibson and Tony Danza, stars at the time. At the award show, Dan and Brian met producer Albie Hetchett, a media executive who struck up a friendship with Dan and Brian. They kept in touch, talked about creating a show together. However, Dan and Brian couldn't create a show at the time due to them being both under contract with ABC and Warner Brothers because of Head of the Class. So they had to wait for Head of the Class to end before talking about a project, which by 1993, Albie became a high-level executive at Nickelodeon, which Brian was already coming up with ideas for creating a show, a sketch comedy show. And eventually, Brian and Albie had these conversations together which then Brian really wanted to enforce his good friend and co-star Dan Schneider being brought in as a suggestion. According to Dan Schneider on his blog, said that he saw this as a side job for his acting career, already looking down on the opportunity itself and having an ego towards it. Dan Schneider just saw this as nothing more than a kid's show, and he found kids' television to be difficult to 
right because there was limitations to it. However, that did not stop him from having adult influences on his content. As we get into the season, we will give examples of that where there are kids moments and then there's some questionable moments. (laughs) I would say, based off watching this season, this very first season, I will say, Keenan and Kel were, and Josh were meant to be stars. I think their stardom comes in a little later, if I'm being really honest. And I could tell that they were setting up writing for them to come in seasons to come. However, my opinion is... I actually really like the females on the show, specifically Angelique, Katrina, and Lori Beth Denberg. They were the stars of the season, in my opinion. And it made sense when Angelique Bates spoke about it, have them having a female writer named Liz Feldman, who was really advocating for the females to get parts, which was a big behind the scene conflict with Dan Schneider, Brian, and the the executives at Nickelodeon because they were more in favor of the males. And that was a lot of the, that was a lot of the controversy going into this season. And this is not the first time a female writer who worked for Dan Schneider has spoken up. There's a female writer from the Amanda show that also spoke up about her experience with Dan Schneider. And her name was Chrissy Stratton. And we will probably one day do a deep dive into the Amanda show and the behind the scenes of that. But all that season one definitely had its battle with gender specifically and gender equality behind the scenes. That was an issue at Nickelodeon. Of course, in the entertainment industry, there is a lot of male bias everywhere we go. But that was a big thing where males felt they could do anything, like literally anything. And I did a whole video on Angelique Bates' story with her and her mom and their conflicts with Nickelodeon specifically that really go into detail of what those battles of conflict were all about, specifically even from a co-star's perspective. But going into the first season, the first sketch ever written, this was written by Dan Schneider himself, actually, was a skit called Cool Shoes, which is a sketch where all the kids have these, like, it feels like very camp, like, Met Gala type of shoes that you would see there, but in a very, like, Nickelodeon-fied youthful version of them but I could see them these being these being like cool like Met Gala like shoes or something but um the thing with the shoes is that it already displays the ongoing foot fetish um elements incorporated since the inception so it really goes to show that Dan Schneider has always had a foot fetish. Like you kind of, when, as you grow up, you kind of always stick to what you like. Like you kind of know what you like in the back of your mind. It kind of just sticks. And yeah, it's already showing like children foot fetish. So yeah, it's kind of something. All right. (laughs) Um, but you know, I, I feel like, there's, yeah, it's already like sh- showcasing foot fetish, truthfully. I don't know if we're able to say that on YouTube, but yeah, the feet thing was there from the inception. And that pretty much was in the first episode of the pilot episode. So some other sketch that I found very interesting was a sketch of Dan Schneider um, and Katrina's imaginary friend. I found that sketch was quite funny. Katrina Johnson really has a knack for comedy, and I'm surprised she never did anything really out after all that. Um, outside of that, because she was she was 
just as funny as Amanda Bynes, truthfully. And so she's a criminally underrated cast member who deserved more. She was only on for three seasons, but she really, she really carried the season, in my opinion. Um, and um, her, this sketch was funny um, until with it was with Coach Creedon until Dan's character specifically tells Kel to rip off his shirt and all his clothes. And again, do we really need all the clothes to come off in children's programming? Like, really? Really? Another sketch that I found that was really relatable, actually, this one was, I will say, was children relatable, was the bad double sketch. Date sketches with Josh and Kel and Angelique and Elisa. I found this one to be quite relatable. I really liked um, everyone's performance in this. This is one that I would say was like kid friendly, and I would have liked I and appreciated more when I was younger as a teenager and everything. But I, I enjoyed this, and I felt you know this was this is good. This is Nickelodeon friendly. I would say. Um, then there's the Super Dude skit with Penny Lane and Milkman, which is Keenan Thompson, um, Penny Lane, Angelique Bates, and Milkman, um, which was an ongoing theme throughout season one and two, and I think carried on through the other seasons even after Angelique was gone. But I know the Super Dude skit was a big Keenan Thompson skit and even a big Josh Server and Angelique Bates skit. There, I don't know if you read my thread on Obscure Nick, I have it pinned up and it's of Cal Mitchell's ex-wife really talking about what the writers had for like cheese and feet. And when you put milk with cheese, it kind of, you know, makes me feel a little uncomfortable with what she was saying and makes me uncomfortable with what the writers behind the scenes were, you know, intending this to be. And there's, also, a lot of what, like, Alexa Nicholas from Zoe 101 said about Jamie Lynn Spears and the goo pop scene in season one where Alexa was specifically instructed to put it all over Jamie Lynn's face. And it was, like, very... Dan really wanted it a certain way. Like, he was very strict on it. And I feel that was the case with these skits, too. And it was just always... It was, like... It, couldn't, it had to be this way or no way, pretty much. That's the vibe that I got from this. So it made me, like, cringe a little. Because I would enjoy these, but with the behind-the-scene knowledge of what these writers were thinking about and why they wanted it this way, it, it, it's, it gets a lot darker. And I hope it's not deeper and darker, but there's, there's a lot of indication and a lot of things being discussed that we could discuss in further videos of this being darker. Then we have another sketch from season one, episode 12, which I found very interesting. Um, it's called, it's a Miss Fingerly skit with Kel's character getting all sorts of calls, pages, faxes, voice messages that this is like so dated in terms of joke material, but also just like, the technology in general is just dated. Another sketch is um, the aerobics class with Roseanne and Steve Urkel, which I enjoyed. I think Angelique's best character on this show was Steve Urkel. And um, Roseanne was Katrina's best character, Roseanne Barr. She did such a good impression. And the faces these two girls make, like they were so comedically talented that they deserved more after the show um and we'll get into the their season exits when we get to those seasons on why they didn't get further in their careers because Angelique Bates really gave a lot of clarity to that and it totally makes sense especially with Hollywood's typecasting on why that was never the case because these girls are so funny like they should be they should have been on SNL as well, like along with Keenan Thompson, truthfully. Like, I really enjoyed this. Katrina's characters, you know, like Ross Perot and Earboy, love that. Love that. Um, 
she did a really good Ross and Pro Perot impression. I would love to see her do like Donald Trump, Joe Biden. I feel I would be interested in seeing that as well. Or Chris Christie. I would love I feel like Katrina could do politicians like pretty spot on. Um, but her Roseanne Barr impression is so hilarious. And I really like that radio skit that she did with Kel, like Dr. K skit. Like they should have kept that in, they should have kept that skit in seasons to come, that radio skit. That was so funny. And the Lemonade Stand Scammer Girl, brilliant. And the girl who's at the club, brilliant. Like those, those are all brilliant characters that I felt really fit her. And she was like the baby in this season in a way until Amanda Bynes came, which we'll talk about Katrina's exit when we get to Katrina Johnson's exit. Cause I have theories on that too. Angelique Bates characters really stood out um, with Penny Lane, Steve Urkel, Randy and Mandy and good burger bath. She had some really good characters as well. I really love the Steve Urkel character, which they seem to weed out after this season, but it's very prominent here. And I have theories on to why based off information Angelique has said herself and Lori Beth Denberg, vital information. That is classic. That is classic. All that. Um, and she always hits the mark. And same with the Miss Fingerly skit. Those two really were probably my favorites from her. I'm not big on the loud librarian, really. But um, she kind of just drives me nuts. Like, just drives me. Anyone who, like, is obnoxiously loud to me will just freaking, like, annoy everything out of me. As for Keenan, his... Um, his his standout characters, I would say, was Randy with all the chocolate loving, all the chocolate loving, the chocolate loving boy, um, super dude, um, and Pierre Escargot, I would say. However, with Pierre Escargot, again, there was a lot of feed things with the duck slippers <laughs> and in the bathtub. Um... You know, um, there's the, there, there was one, there are some funny ones, but there are some that will make you like really uncomfortable, especially it being kids content. May I, on season one, episode 13, he says, may I jump up and down on your sausage? Let's be real. Let's be real. Um, that was a bit let's not do that in kids content. Let's not say that in kids content. Like it goes to show you that not just the females were sexualized, but also the males were sexualized in these shows. And so that made me like really uncomfortable, I will say. Um, and this was back in 1994. So it was a, people can say it's a different time, but it should have never happened. It should have never happened. Period. Um, Cal Mitchell's, um, standout skits, I would say, was the Dr. K. That was brilliant. They should have kept that 100%. I feel Cal Mitchell, I would be interested in Cal Mitchell. Like, he could have, just based off Dr. K, I feel he would have been, like, a really good, like, DJ host or, like, a warm-up type of guy if he wasn't prior. Because Nick Cannon was a warm-up guy, but I find Nick Cannon to be, like, really obnoxious personally but like I get I get why they got Nick Cannon he has that energy but I feel Kel Mitchell could have done that as well just not in the most obnoxious way because Kel Mitchell actually has really good comedic timing as well I will say um and Coach Creedon classic and the Good Burger skit classic so I feel those were his standout characters this season um, Josh Server, I would say, was the ear boy for sure, which, again, ears and body parts, interesting placement. Dan Schneider, that's a good one. Interesting placement, interesting. Um, and Milkman, I feel he did, he, he played like this really corny, obnoxious, like, 60s villain that you would see in like a bat, in like a 60s Batman 
show or something, you know? That's, that's the vibe it was giving me. But that is kind of what children's television around this time was geared towards, and it should be more kid-friendly and, like, corny and obnoxious in a way. That's kind of what it is. Um, and Elisa's characters were never defined this season. I know she has one in one to come, but she was kind of just, like, the pretty girl, you know? And that's nothing nothing really more than that. Um as much, but she did play, she played the good burger customer, the fussy one, always pretty well. Um, and the backpack lost and found sketch was pretty like a standout one for me from this season, from what I got. Um, and I, I, I really do think Elisa Reyes has more comedic potential because I've seen her in the proud family and other shows. And I was like, she's pretty good in these shows. They should have really pushed her further. But again, there's a male bias here that clearly went on behind the scenes. And it kind of, they kind of pushed Elisa aside here. Um, when I feel she had more comedic potential, truthfully, and I feel it could have been elevated in ways, but I don't think they, they had so many people already. They couldn't just find that. And again, they were pushing with some of the impressions that already were clearly established beforehand with Angelique, Katrina, and Lori Beth, that Elisa was still finding her comedic voice, possibly. I would be, like, really interested to know, and maybe I could do a deep dive into this, on what, like, Elisa Reyes's character's growing up, if she, like, was geared towards comedy specifically, and what her, like best comedic impressions are like I would be very interested into doing like an interview with that or if you guys know any interview that would give clarity to that I would like really love to know and because I would love to know what her niche was like her niche exactly um because I'd be very interested in that um there's some other skits that were pretty stand out that were questionable um what size in season one, episode 13, what size Kel trousers Kel was wearing. Um, Katrina gets a kid to take her soda. Um, Keenan, why do you take a bath when you know you'll get dirty again? And they're, they're also trying like a roundhouse paper moment with paper plates here. Um, in season 14, episode 14, the volley sketch was hilarious with Coach Creedon, I will say. And then there was also Coach Creedon and the fake stuffed dog, which was very interesting. Um, this season also included action lead now sketches, which were later added in the Nickelodeon animation show Kablam, which was like a compilation of sketches. It was kind of like, I guess, like, all that and it was like a sketch comedy show but in animation form but this was like the predecessor to that in a way um from what i got i also will say one thing about all that is that they did have really great uh, musical guests here my faves personally were from performance wise based off what i saw was the tlc one coolio debrat Immature, an aftermath featuring Cal Mitchell, which I do like that plug that they were doing that they gave to the stars if they wanted to try out music themselves, which I felt was really cool. Um, but this season has a lot of like battling conflicts with um, dynamics and it's trying to find its footing um, in a way, but I feel like it's a really solid, I think it's a really solid season personally. Um, but it was a season that was trying to find its footing. And with knowing the battling behind the scene conflicts with Liz Feldman and the right, the male writers, like I have to really give Liz Feldman credit for really trying to push for the females and being like giving people like Angelique Bates, Katrina Johnson and Lori Beth like and at least I like trying to push for them to elevate them further which I know in seasons to come that changes a lot and the female actresses don't really get there especially in later years of this show I find except Amanda Bynes really the only one that 
really was pushed further was Amanda Bynes. And something said like, is that Dan Schneider never found women funny and doesn't think women are funny. So that really already, and that's what he said, like, in the writer's room during these days. During these days. And it's, like, so degrading and demeaning, and it's so toxic masculinity. Like, everyone, I don't think, comedy isn't defined on gender. It's not defined on gender. Everyone can do it. It's just the way they execute it, truthfully. And especially being, like, him saying that, like, he, I wouldn't be surprised if he said, like, these cast, these female castmate children are not funny. I wouldn't be surprised if he said that about any of these girls when they have so much potential and they, and it shows, like, gosh, it's so sad that, like, I wish that justice for, like, Angelique Bates, um, Katrina Johnson, and Elisa Reyes, truthfully truthfully and um because i know Lori beth got a chance i feel she Lori beth and amanda Bynes are the only two females from this entire franchise that really got to elevate their comedic um wit but other than that the other females got pushed aside when they're so we're based off the season there is so much potential with them and i hope if they're hearing this they know that specifically and they deserve, they deserve better. They deserve better. Um, Nickelodeon has kept season one out of its run with these episodes not airing since 2000, actually, since its original run, pretty much. And the last time a season one episode has aired on the network was on its 10th anniversary, on the All That 10th anniversary, on April 18th, 2005, which was the DeBrat episode. Um, the only way these episodes were viewed were from old VHS recordings and they, they're not even in like their full form for myself. I got most of it, but there are some missing parts to these episodes, but I got the majority of season one from what I cover today. I don't know what those other missing footage has necessarily, if there's anything there, but if there is, we may come back if they ever get found. Um, but, you know, I, I really think season one surprised me going into this. I've seen some of these episodes before, like years ago when I was a child, but I haven't seen them in a long time. And, um, and I did watch the nineties are all that and everything, but they didn't have season one, of course. So the mystery behind season one is that there was a battling conflict of gender that went behind the scenes. Um, but it really go to show that a lot of these female cast members and all these cast members were the perfect cast for this show. They were the perfect cast. I just wish it was elevated further with everyone in the group. But I feel like this is the most we see with that. And I want to thank you guys for watching this video. Please subscribe, like, and comment. And please check out my Patreon because we're going to deep dive a little further into more Nickelodeon content on my Patreon. You can subscribe now for a month and that would be very appreciated. And any donations you want to send, feel free to send them and that will be appreciated as well. This has been Obscure Nick. Thank you for watching and we'll talk again soon.